So today we'll be sharing our journey along the, uh, the way to data locality on cloud for machine learning and AI workloads. My name is Sean, I'm a software engineer at Loxio, and my colleague Lou, who will be talking about the second half of the deck later, she's a machine learning engineer at Loxio, and at the same time, she's also a PM team member of our Loxio open source project. So here's the agenda of today. So first, we'll talk about the benefits of data locality and what are some of the existing solutions. Then we'll bring up a new design along with this implementation and finally about some production use case and uh, the integration between Oxygen and Ray. So first, about the advantages of bringing data locality to cloud. There are two main reasons. The first is the performance gain. Compared to remote storage like S3 or Azure or GCP, you have faster access to the data. Therefore, there will be less time spent on data intensive applications, especially machine learning and AI workloads. The second main reason is about cost, cost saving because by reading from us, there will be fewer API costs made to the cloud storage. This includes both data and metadata API costs. And because of the performance gain, we'll have higher utilization of your GPU. Less GPU time also leads to less cost. Now we'll look at some of the existing solutions out there. There are the mainstream, mainstream has like two or uh, four solutions. First is to read data directly from remote storage on the fly. Second is to copy data from remote to local before your training. The third is to use a local cache layer for data reuse. And lastly, we can use a distributed cache system. Let's go over them one by one. So first, if we always read, from, read data from remote storage, there will be no data locality. This is the easiest way to set up, but at the same time, every epoch of the training needs to read, read all the data from remote. And because multiple epochs are always, always needed for better accuracy, I mean, there's no way your training only involves one epoch. And then reading from remote will take, can take more time than the actual training. So here's a screenshot that we uh, did a test. This is a uh, PyTorch training on a subset of ImageNet. So you can see 82% uh, of the time is actually spent by the data loader instead of the actual, actual training. Oh, by the way, the, uh, this test the data was on, on S3. So the second way we just mentioned is to copy the data to local before training. So now the data is local so that, so that you can get all the benefits of data locality that includes cost saving and performance gain. But then the management is hard because you must manually delete, delete the training data after use because you have limited disk space. If you don't delete data, then the next person or even yourself, there's no place to store your next training data on your local disk. And also, because we are just cached the data, stored data in the local, the space is limited. Nowadays, we all know the data set can be huge. So only partially or even a small amount of data will be stored locally. So you only get limited benefits of data locality. Now talking about local cache layer for the data reuse, some of the examples including S3FS built-in local cache and Alexio Fuse SDK. Now reuse, reuse data is local as well because after you read the first time, that part of that part data is now cached locally. And this, uh, this local cache system can help you with data management so that you don't have to do manual deletion or manual supervision to make sure everything is deleted and on track. But the same problem is cache space is limited.
Now, the fourth way that we mentioned earlier is to, to use a distributed cache system. This is what a logical two point X looks like. We followed a traditional distributed system architecture where there's a centralized masters and masters means we use some of the algorithm to make sure there is high availability. Now with multiple workers that can distribute among different nodes, we can store much more cache data compared to local cache. And also the system provides data management functionalities. However, we all know on Kubernetes or on cloud, the nodes sometimes need maintenance and there will be master failovers if anything happens. So during that time, master is, is now serving, it's, uh, it's not doing its job. So master is now is a single point of failure. And with AI and machine learning workloads, we are seeing the data set gets larger and larger. It's very common to see a training involves billions of files and all the metadata of these files are stored in masters. So the huge number of files is making the master the bottleneck of overall performance. Now just to, sum, to summarize all the challenges we're facing with all these existing solutions. So first, local cache storage space is limited. And because of amount of data is growing fast, this is, this is now becoming a problem. The second is rel reliability. Because on cloud and Kubernetes, availability is the key for every single service. The third point is scalability. Number of files for training is now huge, in the order of billions. So if, you are, if the metadata or some part of your system is becoming the bottleneck and, it's, and making the system is even slower than just reading the remote storage is certainly not acceptable. And last point is data management. We don't want any manual work, nobody wants. Now let's talk about the new design. The new design involves using consistent hashing for caching the data. We completely removed the masters, which were responsible for, for storing all the metadata of the, of the files. So instead, we are now using consistent hashing to cache both data and metadata on worker nodes. Now the worker nodes have plenty of space for cache because we can horizontally scale them. Now, and because, of, there's, because there's no more masters, there's no more single point of failure, there's no more performance bottleneck on masters, and the system has data management, management system. It looks great. And two, using consistent hashing may bring load imbalance. Some worker can be very busy while others being idle. This not only hurt overall performance, but also may lead to outage because one worker or several workers are, in a, uh, are, are under such high load that can bring down all the system. So then we made, we use this new soft affinity caching solution instead of only storing one copy on um, the hash ring, after storing the first copy, we use this worker's information to hash again to find the next, and the next, of course, it's configurable, and the following workers. Therefore, when the client comes to, comes for data, and if the first worker is under high load or is unavailable because of any maintenance work, you can ask for the second worker or the third worker. This prevents the high load or the unavailability of a single worker. So now let's look at the implementation. In Luxio 3xx, we implement this soft affinity data cache, data cache scheduling algorithm. And we achieved 
much higher scalability. Now one worker can support 30 to 50 million files without any performance degrade. We have also have much higher availability. We have 99.999% uptime and there's no single point of failure. We also have cloud native Kubernetes operator for easier deployment and management. We also newly implement this CSI with fields, fields for training. A lot of fields can turn remote data set into local directory for training so that you can look at a lot stored data or remote, remotely stored store data just as a local directory. The CSI is responsible for launching fields call only when the data set is needed so that the fuse power will not always be there to waste your CPU and memory resources. So with this, we have three layers of caching. We have fuse kernel cache. We have fuse local cache, local disk cache. And then lastly, we have distributed cache. So you can, we can treat this as like L1, L2, and L3 cache layers. And each, so L, this kernel cache is faster than local cache, faster than distributed cache, faster than you know, remote storage. But at the same time, the space is also all, all, uh, growing. There are more stored data in distributed cache than local cache, than kernel cache. Looking at some of the benchmarks. So here we are testing one single worker with 48 threads reading one, uh, reading files of size of 10 kilobytes. And here are three data points. The total file numbers are, I believe this is, um, well, 24 million, 48 million, and I think it's 4 million, yeah. So we can see that there's no, apparently no performance downgrade here, even though the file number, like we have like 10X. We also did a data loading performance test. So the first one is CV training data loading. We are using a subset of the ImageNet compared to S3 FS fields and, and direct reading from S3 with Python Bolo 3. We can see a lot of fields has a much higher IOPS. And for NLP training data loading here, we're using a Yelp academic data set. We can see three APIs of Alexio are all, ha all have better throughput than using S3 FS fields and, Alux uh, and yeah, uh, AWS S3. Now we'll be looking at some real world production use case and I'll hand to Lou from here. Okay, thank you, Sean, for introducing the design implementation. Now I'm going to tell a little more about like, how we actually do that in production use cases. And take the large language model pipeline as an example. So this is shared by one of our users that they do face some problems in their model training and model inference. They mainly face three problems here. So, they normally have multiple clouds that they are actually doing the training with different frameworks like PyTorch, like Spark. And they have that different storage systems. Some of the data sets are stored in object storage. Some of the data sets are actually controlled by their own prone like HDFS cluster. And when training need to load the data from storage system, they found like mainly two problems. So first is that because every time the training need to get the data from the storage system, it need to go through the network. And so that the higher, the further away the data from compute, then the longer time it takes to get the data for your training job. And training job need to repeatedly fetch the data from cloud storage. It will also put the storage system either under really heavy load. So for some object storage like S3, they will basically like set a request limit, they will error you out if you request too much. And we can know that like changing job, they can easily exceed like 10,000 like queries per second. And it will put the uh, on-prem cluster like HDFS under really heavy load. 
that's the time that the storage team will yell at the training team because you guys put us under risk. And especially for the right workload. Nobody wants the right workload to fail, and nobody wants the data to be lost. So that's the time that they say that, okay, whether we can have some solution to improve the GPU utilization rate while keeping my storage system stable. And on the inference cluster is another problem. So after your model is trained by the, your training framework and the model is persisted to the storage system, you want the model to quickly deploy to your model inference cluster. So the quicker that you deploy, the faster you may see some business match increase. Or if the model deployment doesn't work well, you want to quickly roll it back to the previous version so that you help make the, I think that everybody happy there. So that's the three main problems that we see in the LM pipeline. And one of the solution is actually to have a catching solution closer to your model training and model inference. So by using a catching layer between the training job and the story system, we bring the data and model close, closer to the training job and inference job. So instead of like doing each iteration, you always go to the story system to fetch the data. You can only fetch once and then catch it locally and then providing it to your training jobs. So by this way, because uh, Elastio can be located, co-located with the training job, so the latency is much lower and the throughput can be much higher. And similarly, on the model inference side, we can use Elastio to catch the different version of the models so that uh, Elastio helps to fetch the model from the remote storage once and then provide those models to the model, to the model inference cluster. So the deployment plan can be much quicker. I think this one, like Sean already showed before, uh, when training directly uh, with data from the storage system, we, sometimes we can see that there's a lot of time that's actually spent in the data loader. And the data loader rate and the GPU utilization rate are actually like, uh, the higher the data loader rate, the lower the GPU utilization rate. And one way is that we, when we have a catching solution that's closer to our training, we can directly reduce the data loader time, which directly results in a higher GPU utilization rate. And this is also one of the graph that shared by our users. It talks about how long it takes to deploy their model. And so basically the higher the number, the, the longer time that it takes to deploy the model. So we can see that from the left side, the blue and green bars, it basically showing how long it takes to deploy the model when there is no catching solution in war. Where you always need to go to your storage system to fetch the, data, the model that you need. Um, and the middle part is that when they first onboarding a caching solution to catch the models, we can directly see that there is only takes one server time when they first onboarding a caching solution. And the uh, right part is where uh, we actually do some code optimization with their workloads to get rid of the unneeded calls and then to improve the overall performance. And after optimization, it only takes like one tenth of the time compared to original model deployment time. Okay, lastly, we also want to talk about some of, of our newly like integration with Ray. I think there are several talks that I already share you guys about the what's Ray and yeah, there are plenty of things online. So from our perspective, I want to like talk more about the Ray training part. And Ray uses a distributed scheduler to dispatch training job to available workers. So it allows you to seamlessly horizontal scaling of training job across different multiple nodes. And it provides streaming data abstraction for machine learning training for parallel and distributed purpose setting. And I will talk about the Ray streaming later. So Ray do a really good job in their Ray streaming. Uh, basically, uh, considering that you have like CPU and GPU resources, and they didn't download the full data set, and then do the full preprocessing, and then do the full chaining. What they do is that they actually break the task to smaller pieces, so that uh, when your GPUs are busy at chaining with batch data zero, batch zero, and then your CPU is idle. You can actually use that CPU to do the pre-processing for data batch one, and also you can use the CPU to do the data loading for batch two. So once your batch zero training is finished, you can directly move to training on batch one. 
so that you can fully utilize the GPU and CPU resources. And on the other hand, especially when there is a large data set, it may not be able to download the full data set and process and then training because you may have enough disk space on each node to store the full data set. You may want to overlap downloading the data with data preprocessing and training to fully utilize the CPU and GPU resources. On sometimes we also see some of the workloads they didn't do the uh, they did basically didn't use the full data set. What they did is that they do they reading the different or random data set, random subset of the data set, so that uh, the I think the maintainer or, or the data science they don't even know like which part of the data will be used. So by using ray streaming, they only need to load the data that's actually needed. The story sounds great, but there are some problems. Otherwise, we won't come in. So uh, we actually talked to many of the Ray users and see, because we see that the, the idea is amazing. We're sensing that we can help here, especially for the data part. And we actually look at, talk to some of the users on their Slack channel and some Slack posts. We search the history and also talk to the people. And so some of the things that we found here is that the story sounds great, but uh, you may load the entire data set again and again for each apple. I think one really important part is that when your memory size is much smaller than your, the actual data set that needed. So for example, you may have like batch zero data and batch one data. And, but you only have the memory able to hold your batch zero data. Then once you finish training with batch zero, in order to work on batch one, the full memory, the batch zero data need to be erased to have space for batch one. And then when you do the next Apple again, you may need to reload the batch zero data again from your storage system. So the larger the ratio, the, then the more data that you actually need to reread from your storage system. And also like some of our users, they may not only have one RAID pipeline, they actually have multiple RAID pipelines. Or they, or they have some teams that were on PyTorch, TensorFlow, some teams that are using Ray. But they actually share the same data, especially the hottest data inside one company. Then how can we catch the hottest data for those multiple jobs together? It becomes a problem. And some of the users, they want their model basically to store in a kind of shared volume so that it can be shared by all the Ray nodes. So basically, for our users, they don't want to suffer from a cold start every time. They don't want to re-download data, reprocess, so that they can change on those data set. <coughs> that brings Alasio into the Ray ecosystem. So Ray, Ray do a really good job in the machine learning pipeline. It abstracts some of the model training and inference framework so that it, you can do the different stages together and use different machine learning framework together. And Alasio sits between the model chaining and inference framework and also the storage system. It allows us to fetch the data from remote storage, catch it locally, and provide high performance data access for the model chaining and inference. Uh, there's a really simple benchmark that we did actually use like the uh, nightly task that Ray provided to us. So it's, it's also on the Ray public GitHub repo. And we run the task to compare like Okay, what's Alasio plus Ray uh, performance compared to Ray plus S3 direct read? And we can see that with Alasio, the performance increased at least one third. And know that this is with same region S3. So if your storage system is even further away, and if you have network congestion issue, it may bring more benefits. And one of the other parts that uh, most of our users on Bonnie Alasio, not just for performance, but also to reduce their storage cost. Basically, like every data that you transfer between your storage system to your, to your training job, especially the cloud storage, they actually cost you the uh, egress fee or the data transfer fee. So that, especially like when you have a large data set to chain on, the data transfer fee may be really huge. And on the other part, we found that it's actually really method heavy for some of the operations. So for example, when uh, we are training on like ImageNet data set, uh, each file is really small, it's only like 100 KB. You can get the full file through one call to your storage system. However, we do see that even one image read, 
it, it comes with like more than two, usually two to three metadata calls. So for example, where's my file? Is that a real file or is a directory? And then I, I get the file data. So one image read actually calls like two metadata calls and one recall, which is really heavy. So uh, with Alasio, we do see that there's a lot of metadata calls involving here. The calls, if they result in a caching system, in a closer system, it can reduce basically the latency and then improve the performance. And we are also working on the uh, basically rate, like they delegate some of the data loading logics and also the format translation logic to other like Apache project like Arrow and FSBAC, the Python file system interface. So we're also working on that part to see whether we can reduce some of the metadata costs safely and ensuring the correctness while like improve the performance. I think that's it for our talk today and feel free to leave any feedback on the QR code. I'm not sure whether I can receive the, <laughs> the feedback. Um, if you have any question, you can feel free to go to our Slack channel. That's the easiest way to find all the engineers in our company. And if you have issues, then go to the, our Alasio GitHub, like career issue there. And anybody have any question? Actually, it's, it's more people than I imagine. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks.